So welcome to the Preprint to Publication webinar. My name is Martin Esterman, and I am a Prelights ambassador and organizer of this uh, webinar series. If you haven't heard of us, Prelights is a preprint highlight service run by the biology community and supported by the company of biologists. Prelights aims to summarize preprints to promote quick dissemination of scientific findings, funding, finding, <laughs> and encourage discussion between the research community before a formal peer review. So for this last webinar of the year, I have the pleasure to introduce today the Sofin Kamun Lab in the Sansbury Laboratory at Norwich, UK. The Kamun Lab studied the interaction between plant and fil filamentous pathogens and explored state-of-art findings on pathogen genomics and effector biology to develop novel disease-resistant crops. So representing the lab, we have three early career researchers, Georgos Kurelis, Clemens Marshall, and uh, Jose Salguero Linares, that will talk about the past, the present, and the future of the latest manuscript published in science about NLR immune receptor nanobody diffusions that confer plant disease resistance. This manuscript was available in BioArchive in October 2021. It was quite highlighted in November 2022 by the preprint community and the prelites, and finally it was published in March 2023. So with nothing else to add, I welcome Jorgos, Clemens, and Jose to take control of the stage and delight us with their presentation. Oh, you're muted. Classic. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you see my screen? All good? All right, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to indeed present our uh, by now published work on these NLR immune receptor nanobody fusions. And before starting, so I'll start off uh, presenting how this research really started off. Then Clemence Marshall, she will continue with, uh, she's co first off on this work and she'll continue with how we actually took the engineered system and showed that this works for disease resistance. And then finally, Jose will show how this is now being developed into a startup. And before starting, I want to acknowledge some of the other people involved in the work. And that's Andy, who is a very talented pre-doc and now PhD student in the lab here. Adeline Hayant, who is a very talented technician in our lab and lab manager. And then finally, of course, Sophie Kamun, our boss, and all the uh, support staff at TSL who really made this research uh, possible and well allowed for it to go as fast as it goes over here. So... Furthermore, I would like to add that this research obviously fits within a larger scope of other research, and it's in particular this collaboration that we call the Blast of Collaboration with several other labs. And I would like to highlight uh, the contributions made by the labs of Rio Iterauchi and Mark Banfield, whose research has been really important in allowing this research to, to be done in the first place. So really the concept of this research is was how can we take the very best what the animal adaptive immune system has to provide and engineer this into plants and thereby provide plants with this pseudo adaptive immune system whereby they could recognize all these different uh, new pathogens. And this might be a bit of a surprise for some people in the audience, but plants have an immune system. And this is the reason why most plants, when you walk outside, are actually healthy. It's because they're actively resistant towards most, uh, most pathogens. However, when disease does happen, in particular within agricultural context, this can have devastating consequences where you can have tremendous amounts of yield loss and it's going to even have like impacts on like uh, on stability of societies. So how can pathogens be pathogenic on plants? Well, they can be pathogenic on plants by, by virtue of secreting these molecules we call effectors. And so effectors are molecules that are secreted both extracellularly as well as into the host nucleocytoplasm. And these effectors really aim to modulate the host physiology and help the microbe colonize the plant, for example, by shutting off the immune system or by making the plant produce more nutrients for the pathogen and secreting that to the, to the side of where the pathogen is. Now, you can imagine that there's a, a risk as well associated with secreting these effectors as they might be recognized by the plant. And indeed, plants have evolved receptors both at the cell surface and intracellularly that can recognize these effectors and thereby trigger a very potent immune response. 
Now, this is a figure that I, from a review that I wrote during my PhD with my PhD advisor, where we looked at the evolution, really, of our understanding of the plant immune system over time. And one thing that's very clear for this is that, is that the majority of characterized plant immune receptors belong to this class of immune receptors called NLRs, or not-like receptors. So what are these NLRs? NLRs are intercellular sensors of invading pathogens that are conserved across all trees of uh, the entire tree of life. And in plants, they tend to have this tripartite domain architecture where they have this C-terminal leucine rich repeat domain, which is really involved in pathogen recognition specificity as well as intramolecular regulation. They have a central nucleotide uh, binding domain and not domain that's involved in the modular activation upon ligand recognition. And then finally, they have an N-terminal executor domain that's really involved in the downstream response upon recognition and activation. Now, this is sort of the prevailing model, but actually about a decade ago, this seminal paper was published by Stella Cesari et al, where they described what they call the integrated decoy hypothesis. And what they found is that a lot of NLRs in plant genomes tend to be linked in this head-to-head -head orientation with a shared promoter. And what they realize is that while one of these NLRs looks like a normal canonical NLR, the other NLR tends to have additional integrated domains or IDs. And it's really these two NLRs together which are required to give immunity against pathogens. So our idea now, or our understanding of this now, is that what happened over evolutionary time is that certain host proteins, which were targeted by these effector molecules, as susceptibility factors for the pathogen to cause disease, somehow through uh, genetic mechanisms that we don't fully understand and they're probably, probably quite varied, they managed to genetically integrate into these NLR receptors, making what we call NLR IDs or NLRs with integrated domains. And now we really think that these integrated domains act as a, as a bait or as a trap to trap the pathogen into a recognition event. Now, this might seem like something that is exceedingly rare, but that's actually not the case. And about 5% of all plant NLRs contain these integrated domains. And this is found all across the plant NLR phylogeny. And pretty much any domain you can think of that a pathogen might want to target, you can find integrated. And so this really led to this idea that perhaps, you know, we can start bioengineering this. And by swapping these domains, we might get different recognition specificities. And if you want to do that, you need to have an NLR pair that you want to start off with. And the NLR pair that we work with mostly is called the pig pair. And this pig pair comes from rice originally, where it consists of two NLRs, the sensor NLR with this integrated HMA domain. So we call it the sensor because it has the integrated domain, and we, this is the one that really senses the pathogen. The helper NLR that's required for the sensor to trigger the immune response. And together, these recognize the AVR PIC effector from the rice blast pathogen Magnaportha rhizae. And upon this recognition, they confer immunity towards this rice blast pathogen uh, containing this effector. Now, what's very cool about this, uh, about this NLR pair is that this is what we call a minimal genetic unit. So it means that when we take these NLRs from rice and we now put them into Nicotiana benthamiana or benthi, which is a wild tobacco relative, which is very unrelated to rice. Um, and we put them together. Now, only when we have all three components together, that's the helper, sorry, the sensor, the helper, together with the recognized component, we get this immune response. And this immune response here is seen as what we call a hypersensitive cell death response. Um, so you see the cell death here. Now, normally, this happens on a more microscopic scale. But in this case, we make every plant cell produce all of these components. So you can very nicely visually see this. It makes it a great experimental system. And we know from uh, work in Mark Banfield's lab as well that really this AVR PIC effector directly binds to the integrated HMA domain. And that direct binding is required for the recognition and immunity. So our idea is like if we take this pair, and we swap out this integrated domain for any other domain, can we get recognition of other components and immunity against different pathogens? And if we do this, what would be the ultimate integrated domain? And on our wish list, we want something that's small and soluble, so about the same size of the original integration. We want it to be highly specific, but also have high affinity toward whatever it's recognizing, because we don't want, want it to recognize things uh, off-target things, because we'll get autoimmune responses. 
And ideally we have a domain that's further engineerable. That means that we do this integration once and then by making small mutations, we can change the specificity rather than having to reinvent the wheel every time. And in order to do this, uh, we settle upon using nanobodies. So what are nanobodies? Nanobodies are these camelid derived single chain antibody fragments. So a regular antibody looks something like this, where you have a heavy chain and a light chain, which are two different proteins. And it's really this heavy chain together with the light chain that make the antigen recognition specificity. Now, biochemically, this is very annoying to work with, uh, but camelids have had a mutation in some of their antibodies where they have these heavy chain only antibodies. And now you can take this minimal antigen recognition uh, uh, domain from these uh, antibodies and you have what is, what is called a nanobody. And that's a very small protein, which has extremely high affinity and specificity for whatever you raise it against. And this hit basically hit everything on our wish list. It's small, soluble. Most of these work well intracellularly. Uh, they're highly specific, have extremely high affinity. They're engineerable because we can very easily raise more nanobodies against different things. And one final thing on this list is that these are orthogonal domains. So that means in plants, there's no domain quite like this, which makes it more unlikely that these things will randomly bind other components in the plant. So this is really what, what, we, what we did in the beginning. And to prove, really as a proof of principle, we took very well characterized nanobodies against fluorescent proteins. And so if anyone has ever worked with, for example, the GFP trap beats for doing IPs with GFP, these are the nanobodies that are in, in those GFP trap beads. And now what we did is we had our sensor NLR, PICM, PICM1, and we swapped this integrated HMA domain for the nanobody. So we make this genetic sequence that encodes the nanobody in between the CC and MBR domain in this case. And now combined with the, with the helper NLR, we call this system the PicoBody system. And in order to test the system, I've already shown a picture, but in order to test this, we use this uh, this method of transient expression in Benthi, where we can take agrobacterium, which can uh, gen which can inject DNA into plant species. And we, we put our pico bodies on in this agrobacterium and different fluorescent proteins. And then we can infiltrate this into plant leaves and get patches where these proteins are specifically expressed. Um, and basically what we expect to see is now if we have a pico body that recognizes GFP and we co-express this with GFP, we should see this hypersensitive cell death response. But ideally, we would not get this if we have an empty vector control. So this would mean that we have a specific response. Obviously, uh, it might not work at all. So we might see no response at all. Or it might be that by mutating our NLR, we make an autoactive thing, in which case we'd see... Uh, an immune response in our empty vector control as well. And this is uh, really an experiment. So these constructs were cloned over Christmas during COVID. And the first experiments were done also over Christmas during COVID because there was nothing else to do. And basically what I'm showing here is uh, several nanobodies that all bind GFP. And I want to draw your attention to this enhancer nanobody. So when we have this enhancer nanobody integrated into our pico body scaffold, and we co-express this with GFP, we see this very strong hypersensitive cell death response. But we do not see this when we have our empty vector control, which in this case is a different fluorescent protein, M. cherry. So this was very exciting to see, obviously, because this means, well, yeah, it works. Um, and it didn't just work once, we could do it the other way around as well. So when we now take nanobodies that bind M. cherry, and I want to draw your attention to LAM4 over here, where when we co-express this with M-Cherry, we see a very strong hypersensitive cell death response, but not when we express it with GFP. Meaning that, yes, we can do this. We can do this against multiple targets with very high specificity. And this is uh, what was already shown in the bioarchive preprint. Um, but one thing that was not in the bioarchive preprint yet is that when we look at this, you can see that some of these actually don't behave as nicely. So for example, this LAM3 over here, which should only respond to M-Cherry, also gives a response to GFP. And the question then is why do some of them work and why are some of them autoactive or not responsive? And in our minds, there could be two main reasons. Uh, one is maybe we have unspecific binding, but this seems very, very unlikely because we know these, these nanobodies have extremely high specific or should have extremely high specificity for what they bind. 
So one other thing actually that came up is perhaps some of these don't fold well. And indeed, only about one in three nanobodies uh, tend to fold well intracellularly. And during the time from when this was on BioArchive to publication, uh, this paper came out on BioArchive as well, which is by now also published in eLife, where they defined this general approach for stabilizing nanobodies for intracellular expression. So they found that when they make certain mutations in the stable backbone of nanobodies, they, they fold better intracellularly. And we took those mutations and introduced them into the nanobodies that we're using. And again, I'm showing LEM3 over here, where we have LEM3 being should only respond to M-cherry, where we have an unspecific response in our GFP infiltration. And when we now introduce these mutations, in this case, there were four or five residues changed, we lose the unspecific uh, response, but we maintain the specificity and activation uh, upon bi uh, binding M-cherry with this hypersensitive cell death response. So this was for me personally a very cool thing. Um, yeah, so, and basically this means that we can we can take most nanobodies and and now make them functional within our scaffold and get them to work. And so this is really the immune recognition part. So for the next bit, I'll give the screen to Clem, who will show how we how we went from immune recognition to immunity. Um, your go. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully you see the proper screen. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, I would like to thank again um, Martin for inviting us uh, to present our work here and also Winnie for organizing and having us here. Uh, so as Jorgos mentioned, the next step for us was to see if this engineered immune receptor would actually confer immunity against pathogens. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. So obviously, finding pathogen that can express GFP and m cherry it's not very easy. So we had to engineer our own. So we took a virus, potato virus X, that can naturally infect Nicotiana bentamiana. And the good thing with this virus is that you can easily engineer it to express heterologous protein, providing that they are quite short. So we engineered uh, PVX to express either GFP or M-cherry. And as Yorgos explained, we delivered the virus via agrobacterium uh, in Nicotiana bentamiana together with the different PICO bodies. And then we waited for four days uh, to allow for the virus to accumulate. And we had two different readouts. So first of all, the fluorescent in the fluorescence intensity in each infiltration spot, as you can see here, that we use as a proxy for how much virus there is uh, in a given spot, and also check uh, accumulation of the fluorescent protein via Western blood. So this is how the data look like. So we took a leaf that we scan. Um, to detect GFP fluorescence. And the darker the spot, the more GFP there is, so the more virus accumulates. So just to briefly talk you through the different receptors that we have here. So anti vector is nothing in the vector, just the backbone as a negative control. Rx is the genuine resistance gene that confers resistance against PVX, so it recognizes PVX code protein. So PICO body enhancer and PICO body uh, LAM4, you've heard about it. Uh, PICO body enhancer has the nanobody that binds GFP and LAM4 binds M-cherry. PCAM is the wild type and original uh, rice uh, pair of PCAM1 and PCAM2. And this is the infiltration buffer only. So as expected, anti-vector allows the virus to prol proliferate happily. So we have a big patch of GFP fluorescence. The same for the wild type, uh, so non-engineered peak pair. And what was really interesting for us and really exciting was the phenotype of pico body and answer was very similar to that of the natural resistance gene Rx. So it didn't allow the virus to replicate very well. So we don't have a lot of fluorescence. And this was specific because in pico body LAM4, the virus can accumulate. So to be a bit more quantitative, you can look at the fluorescent intensity uh, on the box plot. And for Rx and Pico body and answer, it's really similar to the infiltration buffer only where there is no virus, but we have increased fluorescence intensity in all of the construct we tested. And when we look at the actual accumulation of the fluorescent protein here, GFP from PVX GFP, we have a very similar pattern with 
viral accumulation in our controls and also pico body LAM4 and no viral accumulation in Rx, a very little in pico body and answer. So that was really exciting because that means that at least in transient assay, it seems that the receptors are able to prevent the virus from accumulating. And so one of them that was already published in the bioarchive version of the manuscript. And after submission to the journal, one of the main uh, comments from the reviewer was, does this actually hold true in stable transgenic line? Because if you want to use this at some point in agriculture, you need to show that transgenics also work. So for the revisions, we generated several transgenic lines, um, so several independent transgenic lines e expressing the pico body and answer, and also lines that express, uh, I'm only showing one here, but lines that express the wild type rice uh, pair as a negative control. And this is the untransformed wild type bentamiana. And this is just to show that at least phenotypically, it doesn't seem to have any impact on the plant growth or development to ectop ectopically express uh, these receptors. And when you when we actually look at the expression, uh, so these are Western blood to detect either the sensor, so the protein that carries the nanobody, or the helper, the canonical NLR, uh, we can see that the pico body and answer line, all but one accumulate the sensor. So we kept this one in as, a neg as an additional negative control for assays but we can detect PKM1 in all of them and also in the wild type. And when we look at PKM2, we can also detect it in um, three out of the four pico body lines and in the wild type. And we can see very faintly uh, Rx in the transgenic Rx line here. So they express the receptors and they seem to be happy uh, phenotypically at least. So for us, the next step was to challenge these plants again with the engineered version of PVX. Uh, so in this case, uh, we wound inoculated the plants. So briefly, this is just picking up some agrobacterium culture that is transformed with PDX GFP or M cherry and poking holes in the leaves. Um, so we have one side of the leaves that's uh, inoculated with the PDX GFP variant and the other side of the leaf that is inoculated with the PDX M cherry. We wait for seven days for the virus to be able to accumulate if it can. And then we sample around the inoculation site and look for the accumulation uh, here of the coat protein, because in between we could get our hands on an antibody that specifically binds the coat protein of the virus. So we don't have to use the fluorescent protein as a proxy anymore. So, and this is how it looks like. So, so our controls, the wild type, uh, we have accumulation of the virus as expected. Same for the wild type non engineered pig pair. And Rx, also as expected, doesn't allow for accumulation of the virus. But when we look at our pico body lines, which was really exciting for us, was all of the lines that we saw previously express the receptor have actually no virus accumulating um, in the leaves. And the one that didn't express them had virus accumulating. So it seems that it does work uh, in stable transgenic. And just to be sure that it was specific, we obviously also looked at the PVX GF, PVX M cherry, sorry, uh, virus strain. And as you can see here, all of the pico body and answer line are not able to prevent the virus from accumulating in this case, uh, because the nanobody that it carries doesn't bind M cherry. And Rx obviously still works since uh, it binds the code protein. So you can imagine that if you are able to very efficiently uh, identify pathogen effectors that are causing very strong epidemics in our agricultural field, engineer, uh, raise nanobody against this, or screen synthetic nanobody libraries um, to de um, detect, uh, identify, sorry, nanobodies that can bind this pathogen effector. We can then integrate these or only transfer the mutations into the nanobody. Uh, to be able to generate new pico bodies and hopefully going from susceptible plants to resistant plants. So this was my part. And I think Jose is going to be able to talk to you a bit more about what's next uh, for this project. Thank you for listening.
right? Right. Thank you very much, Martin. Can you can you hear me? Pirami. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to be here presenting um, how we're taking this innovative technology farther into a startup. So my name is Jose. I am CSO and CEO of Nalarix, which is a biotech startup that is leveraging this technology that you just heard about to make designer resistance traits for crop protection. So before I actually go into detail in what we do, I would like to first introduce you the magnitude of the problem that we're trying to solve. So it is estimated that almost 30% of global crop production is lost to plant pathogens each year. And this is actually food that is lost and adds up to feed several billion people on the planet. The situation is getting worse and worse since climate change is actually accentuating this plant health crisis as new pathogen races can evolve um, causing disease. So we need to sustainably produce more with less to meet the global demand for food. And for that, we need the most innovative technologies available out there. So unfortunately, um, we've been using uh, pesticides in order to keep diseases at bay. These pesticides are harmful for the environment, extremely expensive, and sometimes even ineffective at controlling diseases. Conventional breeding have been somehow successful throughout history. However, it's very laborious and very time consuming. Needless to say that there are limited sources of resistance in nature. And often when you breed resistance genes, underside traits come with them into elite cultivars. So without, without a doubt, genetic engineering is the most effective strategy to precisely breed resistance into elite varieties. However, there's still the challenging of finding sources of resistance. So efforts to engineer resistance have been narrowed in scope somehow because finding a resistance gene in wild relatives or unrelated species can actually take a lot of time. One then would transfer that resistance gene into a susceptible fan, hoping that it will get resistance. However, transferring single resistance genes often uh, can be uh, a very bad idea because these resistance gene can be overcome by, by new uh, evolving pathogen races. So how can we bioengineer resistance genes in pre-existing genes to bring new to nature functionalities. And what we have in our hands is basically a technology with Pico bodies that enables fast, efficient, and versatile development of designer resistance genes. So Pico bodies, as, as you've heard from Jorgis and Clem, are NLRs fused to protein binders. They don't have to be strictly nanobodies. It can be any protein binder that can essentially recognize a pathogen protein that's delivered by the pathogen inside of the plant cell. So if you introduce these pico bodies into susceptible plant, you can get resistance. And we believe that we can do this in a much faster way than conventional um, genetic engineering that was done in the past. Our technology also allows us to design and deliver gene stacks. And this was very nicely shown in the publication of Jorgos and Clem. So we could essentially have different uh, sensor P1 uh, NLRs that are targeting different components of the pathogen, different effectors, in this way providing a more robust solution uh, to the pathogen in the long term. So as Clem has already shown, we, we demonstrated that Pico bodies indeed can confer resistance to potato virus X stuck to GFP. And here I, I would like to give a shout out to Andres who uh, nicely uh, made these pictures of a transgenic plant in Nicotiana benthamiana that's carrying Pico body enhancer targeting PVX, GFP, and as you can see, uh, the systemic resistance is quite, quite nicely observed compared to a wildfire plant. So how can we provide value in our company? So our pipeline looks like the following. So we actually have the expertise in-house to find and identify uh, plant pathogens that are causing harms in the field we can understand and we can pinpoint which pathogen effectors are critical for causing virulence. And we can use that information to design a resistance gene tailored to the pathogen that is infecting the field. In that way, once we have preliminary data that indeed our resistance gene works specifically and it can provide resistance, we can engage in partnership with big agritech companies that can uh, essentially put our 
pico body into elite varieties. So what markets can we go after? So obviously soybean is a commodity crop that is grown worldwide. And this, this market is actually very appealing for us. Market is huge. The soybean seed market is also huge. And something very important is 94% of soybeans that are grown particularly in America are genetically engineered for various traits. More important than that, there are no effective resistance strategies against two major diseases. Asian soybean rust and soybean cyst nematode, which account for losses that are up to 80% and 100% respectively. So we think that our technology could have a great impact uh, when tackling this disease. Corn is also a very appealing market because of uh, the main reasons that I described for soybean. It's a huge market. 92% of corn that's grown in America is genetically engineered, again, for various traits. And I, we think that our that our technology could actually tackle some major diseases such as southern rust and common rust, which account for major losses in the US. So in my kind of like last slide, um, I would like to kind of like give an overview of what happened throughout the last three years. So Pico bodies were discovered in 2021. Uh, we filed a patent, well, Jorgos and Clem filed a patent in 2021. The preprint came out in BioArchive uh, also in, 20, in 2021. And at that time I was doing my PhD in Barcelona. And I remember that I was actually at the gym when I when I saw this preprint coming out. And I was, I mean, my mind blew away. I was like, this is extremely cool. So I instantly contacted Sofian and uh, we started talking about the possibility of me joining the Sainsbury lab um, to establish a company by leveraging this technology. So the technology was published in, in a scientific journal in 2023. I came to the Sainsbury lab in May 2023 after finishing my PhD. And recently the group was awarded uh, 2.5 million academic funding. Uh, and we hope that with our startup, we can provide proof of application of Pico bodies in crops um, in 2024, so next year. Uh, as of now, we are a team of plant molecular biologists and the company um, is basically starting. So I am the co-founder, CEO and CSO, and Sofian is also a co-founder and he's acting as a scientific advisor. So we will uh, hopefully start recruiting very soon um, for, for 2024. And of course, I have to acknowledge the, the two inventors of this technology, Jorgos and Clem, that did a fantastic job and really set the ground for me to, to establish my company. And with that, uh, I think we're all open to, to answer questions. Thank you. So remember that you can type questions in the Q&A section. Um, so while we're waiting for them, I want to ask you maybe, Jose, if you can talk or any of, of you talk. If, um, if you try to move this system from the tobacco plant to any other of the plants that you're interested in, for example, the soybean or the, the corn, and if you are planning to prove in the short term if this technology could be moved between plants, or it need to be adjusted a little bit to each of them. Yeah, so maybe I can reply to that one, Jorgos. Okay. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, as proof of concept, we, we're trying to move this system into rice, which is where originally uh, came from, let's say, because the pigs come from rice, and we will hopefully have data pretty soon. Uh, but again, this will still be proof of concept. And of course, for more uh, commercial side of things, we would uh, we would move for we would move for uh, soybean and corn and uh, I mean we, we are starting uh, doing this this work of targeting key diseases that we think could make sense uh, to go after and I will not disclose exactly which ones but uh, I kind of gave an idea when I, when I gave my presentation. Yeah, I think I can add to that the fact that you know we can move it from rice to uh to to tobacco is already a very a big long. jump. That's the big jump. Yeah. And uh and at the same time we know from some other things that these NLRs are they can really function on their own. You can pretty much put them in any organism. You could you could probably move this to non-plant species as well. And it, it would is very likely to still function there as well. It might like the, the, the downstream signaling might not per se work, but what they do this activation upon ligon recognition, that is something that, that is going to work regard, probably regardless of where you put it. Uh. So there's a question in the Q&A from Juan Carlos de la Concepcion. It says like, 
how are you going to test whether Picobol is working current or soybean in 2024? Is there any trend aside that you can do? And then they say, oh, maybe you cannot disclose it. Oh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of obvious, right? I mean, you can try protoplasting, right? You can use protoplast. You can uh, put uh, Pico bodies uh, targeting your particular effector, and you can test whether you get cell death in there or not. This is, uh, again, not not a definite answer because you will still need to do transgenics, but it can give you an indication that this indeed can work. So I have another question more to the, oh, this one. This is from Angela Barbero. It says, congrats, great ideas in this work. Do you perform experiments on reinfection? Could this strategy be used as a treatment for sick plants? Who wants to answer this one? I oh, think maybe I can, I can quickly add. So we didn't really do reinfections. Uh, and in the paper, it was mostly local infections that we looked at, uh, even for the accumulation in the stable transgenics. But Andy, so the pre-doc uh, that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, did some systemic assays when we allowed the virus to be able to move to the upper part of the plant. And as Jose showed, we can actually show that there is resistance in this particular uh, assay as well. So it's not only locally, but it also prevents the virus from moving and infecting the, the whole plant. Uh, as to and can it be used to use as a treatment for sick plant, this we, we haven't we haven't tested. Uh, yeah, but the idea is that uh, essentially we we do transformants, right? So mm -hmm. we do transgenic plants so that uh, you essentially equip the plant to not get sick. I think that was a kind of like an interesting idea. Uh, I don't know how feasible it would be, but instead of generating like a transgenic, you can get like a transient expression of this protein. And maybe that would be more appealing to the community these days that they're trying to get GMO free plants. So maybe trying to do something that you can actually treat the plants with these um, plasmids, maybe uh, without having a, a transgenic per se or integration to the genome, maybe it could be interesting to see. I think this, uh, in theory, should be very, very feasible. But with the current setup of the current system, it's still going to be like there are two, there are two proteins involved, and they're both quite large. Um, so you, you know, you need to somehow deliver that and get it to go to probably the entire plant, and then you're probably thinking about viral vectors and things like this. And uh, at the moment, they cannot accommodate such a large cargo. But with further engineering. These are things that that should, in theory, be at some point in the future <laughs> feasible. Yeah. So I also wanted to ask something about the the antibodies. How easy would it be to get antibodies made in camelids that are specific for pathogens that are affecting plants, for example? Um, do you think this would be feasible? Do you, I think due to the size of the camelids, like trying to um get them might be like lengthy process or um, what do you know about these or you can do it like in vitro like they can do with the monoclonal antibodies um you want to answer this Glenn? uh yeah so how do we identify the the nanobodies or antibodies right so yeah so i mean one one way is yeah immunizing the, the animal with the purified protein and that's what most that's what a lot of companies offer as a service but also now there are many libraries of synthetic nanobodies that are available so another way is just to take advantage of these libraries and screen them against the protein of interest so we completely bypass the the animal stage uh, so we don't have to wait until the animal produces the nanobody um, and we also don't poke animals as well, which is quite nice. Uh, so yeah, so there are many companies now as well that have these synthetic libraries available. Um, and we've actually we we've we've used one uh, to raise an antibody against the pathogen effector, and could show that in the transgeta say in Bentamiana, it does work. It recognizes it, uh, but we still have to show whether it works uh, in transgenics. That's really interesting to hear. I was going to ask you, like, if you have any pathogen in mind that you want to test it. So that's basically answer my question. Um, so I think um, there is a question in the chat is, what's your feeling on the limitations of the factors you can test? Is the PIC system, they have 
In the PIC system, they had to bind on to a specific side of the integrated domain. Yeah, I can add to that. I think uh, indeed, like if you think about the way this folds, like the the binding side should be available, right? Um, and fortunately, with the nanobodies, like the way the way they do their binding, it seems to be the case that in most cases they will work straight out of the box. When you go towards other types of integrations, um, that will remain a, a case by case testing. And, and some of them will work better than others. And in some cases you might have to play around with the exact uh, location of where you integrate and maybe add some extra things to turn things around a little bit to make them, to display them in a, from a different side in the folded protein. Um, and what I think is the success rate uh, with the nanobodies against GFP and M Cherry in the end, our success rate, we tested 11 and after the further engineering to make them fold uh, better intercellularly, I think uh, nine out of 11 worked. Um, so two of them gave no response at all. One of them uh, I realized was a partial sequence. So there's a full length sequence out there. It wasn't just not properly reported in the material metrics uh, section of an art paper. Um, and and then and one of them didn't work. Uh, that, was, that remained autoactive, but the rest responded as we wanted. And when it goes to other integrations, uh, I I can say it's going to be, it's going to be hit and miss, and some will work, and then any variation thereof will work, and some just will never work, in in this particular scaffold. So in between the reviews, you mentioned that you had to, like the reviewers asked you to make it actually in a plan. Were you these? Um... Were you anticipating this and you were working with this while it was reviewing or you have to wait from the review then to start working on the plan? How was the process of that? And how long does it take for you from the like first moment that you to make John Chang until you grow them to have like a rough idea of the timeline? Yeah, maybe I can take that one. Uh, we we start we initiated the transgenic the transgenics be before having the reviewer comments because that was something that we did anticipate. Yeah, indeed. But yeah, it's Ventamiana, so it takes a long time. And this is also partly why uh, there is almost, well, there is yeah, a year between us submitting to the journal and uh, being able to submit the revision. And then obviously it goes again through a round uh, of reviewer, reviewer comments and reviewer input. So yeah, for it took uh, it took maybe eight months I think to generate the transgenic, and we are very lucky at TSL that we have a whole team dedicated to do that. So we didn't do it ourselves, but a, a whole team at the Sainsbury Lab did that. Um, so yeah, it was we were really in a good place uh, for that. So I think there is something that you didn't go deeper into this, but I think maybe Jose, it's like a like an outcome of this, but. Um, because there was a huge time between the preprint and the publication, uh, do you see any benefit of having it pre uh, publicated, like or having a, as a preprint that early? And if that had an effect later, and um, for you to be like known, or maybe collaborations, or talking to other people, or in this case, like generating a company of it. Um, so if you want to talk about this, if it was helpful for you or not to having it out a year and a half before the actual publication. I mean, for me, obviously, like uh, it really made me uh, first get very interested into the project, contact Sofian, uh, go, th go go through the entire you know interview process, come here to TSL, get, gave a seminar, so on and so forth. The publication was not out out there yet, like the actual uh, the actual uh, print publication. Um, so all of that wouldn't have happened if the publication hadn't been out there. So. That goes to show how preprint really benefits us as scientists to to continue with our careers and without having to to stop them basically. And so, for you as first authors, do you have any effect where you invited to give a talk? Um, did it help you to um, get a position um, before the publication, or what, what was the effect that you can sense of it? You want to go first, Yorgos? Yeah, I can say like, so for me, uh, I mean, this this having it pre-printed really helped me in applying for positions. And I'll be starting next month in the Imperial College. And if anyone is watching, 
and now it's a, a, a final year undergraduate or master student, I, I there is a, a, a PhD uh, possibility uh, with me and I will be continuing bioengineering of different immune receptors. Um, so that's what I'll be working on. So if, if, unfortunately they have to be a UK resident or a uh, EU citizen who has right to remain. Um, to contact me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it really helped me to do that, to really think about starting that application as well. Like I had it there. There was a really an amazing feedback on Twitter and, you know, people emailed, like it, it got a major uh, response, the paper. And that really helped, you know, beyond just talks also just with the confidence of being like, yeah, you know what, I can go for this. Like it's, it's a time and I knew at one point, like, you know, that the paper is going to come out and, you know, you can start saying this when you apply for things. So, and, uh, and also with grant applications is uh, having the preprints out uh, makes a very big difference, uh, I think, um, as it should. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I mean, if I can, can I share a slide? Actually, I made a, I made a slide for that, just because I think it's might be a bit more visual. So just so, so you can see maybe the timeline. Um, so for me personally, but also um, but also for me personally, as you can see, so we posted it in October uh, on BioArchive and it was published in March, 2023 at the end in science. But in between, I mean, both Yorgos and I uh, got the opportunity to present it at conferences. And as early career researcher, uh, it's really nice to already have the preprint out as well because you fear maybe a little bit less to be scooped or, or so on and so forth. So you feel a bit more confident and a bit safer that it's out there already and uh, you can then present it at conferences. We also got invitations to write review articles uh, during, during the year before it was actually published. Um, so it was really, really good, especially at, at this step of our career, obviously, to have all of this opportunity to showcase of, of our work and then be able to use that uh, for the next step in our career and apply for our next position. Um, so yeah, I think I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced about preprinting. So it didn't have to convince me before, still doesn't have to convince me. So I think if you can, you should definitely, definitely go for it. And even with the patent, as you can see, we could file the patent and there was also no problem uh, with submitting it to BioArchive right after. As long as it's filed before it comes out, uh, there is also no problem. So there's another question in the Q&A from Angela Barbero. It says, NLR are intracytoplasmatic. Do you plan to try this strategy with other receptors or maybe express the picabolis on the cell surface? I think Georges can answer this one. Yeah, so I don't think expressing them cell cells would be kind of fun to try, but I, I don't, I doubt it will work. Um, but it, it would still <laughs> it would be funny to try. Uh, but I think this is uh, this is definitely one of the research lines I'll be continuing to take the the concepts of of uh, that were in the paper really and apply that to different immune receptors, um, and see indeed can we get recognition uh, in other locations. That would be probably one of the primary targets to start off with, um, but not yet shown. I have a question about the patent process. So how it's possible, or what's the patent include in your system? Is the whole system is there? Uh, because you, you include some part of a, like a nano body. So is that part also part of the the whole thing or is the whole idea, how does it work, to be honest? Um, and how you can patent some biological products and how how inclusive or how uh, like strict is the, what you can um, hold the ownership of? So is as it, of now- Is it published? Is it like uh, available everywhere? You yeah, can... it is available. It is yeah. available. Um, I mean, we are still in the process of filing in individual countries. Um, so it hasn't been uh, granted yet. Um, but I, I mean, the claims are basically inter integration of nanobodies or any other domain um, inside of the peak scaffold for conferring um, 
immune receptors with uh, new to nature functionalities specificities that's that's pretty much the summary of it uh, we will see what we get <laughs> so for example if you want to move it to mammalian do you think you would need to file a new patent for that or it's also included into this it's i think we included that as well we included mammals we included everything to be honest yeah because this now is you're planning a strategy that you follow right you try to to broaden it as much as possible yeah. yeah and are you planning to test this in main mammals for example against like avian flu or any other pathogen that could affect also like the livestock or production i think it's going to be possible to do it in humans that would be like a crazy idea but um, maybe to any other like small animals rodents or anything that you can test it that okay this could be also be used to confer um immunity or a fast response in uh, other animals I think what I can say to that is I think there are some papers out there now where they look at a, a human and a LARS that recognize certain viral proteases or proteases from different uh, uh, other like bacterial species, I think. And I'm pretty sure you can engineer those sites and they've shown some uh, engineering with these receptors as well. Uh, the uh, The main question is that obviously if you do this, um, like uh, how, how are you going to apply it? What would be, you know, how this is going to really turn into a... Uh, 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 a cure for something i'm sure there could be there could be ways uh, but there's probably many steps in between you know doing engineering and then having it applied whereas in plants it's very straightforward to make transgenics uh and you know go for it but maybe jose has other ideas <laughs> no no i mean it, this is an off off on switch right uh this is kind of like the summary of, of what the tool is so um, with uh, certain engineering endeavors, you could foresee a system that gets on whenever you want, when it senses an input, and off uh, when there is no input. So how can you apply this in mammals? Um, that's another question. Uh, but I think the tool should be orthogonal. And a little bit of question of the transgenic plant. So um, I want to know if it's actually the whole system was expressed in the whole plant. Or it was like, for example, targeted to the leaf. And it's based on this idea of, are you thinking of uh, restricting the expression size with only expressed in the area that is affected, for example, by the pathogen to be like the, the leaves for different virus, or if it's a nematode that's underground, maybe the roots could be an important site. Um, how easy is in plants? That's something I don't know to control the gene expression. And if you're planning to do this, maybe in the future. Yeah, I mean, well, Jogos is more a uh, symbio person than me, but uh, uh, I mean, in principle, you could do it. You can use specific promoters for the tissue that you're interested in. Um, I think for the paper, this is really a proof of principle, yeah. like showing, you know, the system can work. Then you go to proof of application, like, hey, we can use this against something useful. So that's that's sort of what is happening at the moment. And then finally, after that, you go to uh, scaling and optimizing and and then it's definitely when you start thinking about using the right promoters, having the right expression levels in the right place, um, you know, to prevent auto activity or not. And, you know, perhaps you want to have something, you know, not in the edible parts of the crop, because maybe people will be annoyed by that. So, but then you say like, well, it's only expressed in non-edible bits, um, you know, so that, that I think from a from a, from a biological point of view, that, that wouldn't really matter, I think. Our, our system seems to be quite on off. Uh, but for for purposes of maybe putting something out there in the field, like that that could be uh, a selling point. Um, so, but I think that is that is definitely stuff that has to be done in the near future. Yeah. But the very, very good points. And to, to answer you, uh... Your question, it was on the strong and constitutive promoter in these lines. So yeah. the lines that we published for the paper. So supposing they expressed everywhere. Um... I have a, a little bit of a question of um, the paper. So th it ended up in science. It's a really huge journal. Do you always knew that it was going to be like in a really impact journal? Or you? when was the moment when you realized, oh, this could be a big thing? 
Um, was it from the beginning? Was it when you saw the first result in the plant at work? Um, I want to know a little bit more about the story of like, how do you conceptualize this paper? How do you um, think it for the big, really big journal? Do you actually have to write it in a different way? You have like so many supplementary figures and only a few main, main figures. So how was this process um, during the whole project? Nam? Uh, well, I mean, for us, I think it was from the very beginning, we wanted to try because, I mean, you don't really risk anything, right? You just try and see see how it goes. And so, you know, in our, in our case, it went. So we are really happy about that uh, because it was really new and using nanobodies. So these proteins in plants for this specific application and showing that it actually works. So we thought it was uh, interesting enough to the broader science community and not only like plant biologists or pathogeneticists. So we we thought maybe we should try and see see how it goes. Uh, regarding the writing, well, yeah, of course, so science has a quite very specific uh, way of writing the paper. So that this is why we have many supplemental figures uh, in the supplementary materials because I think we are only about four. Uh, so yes, this was restriction restriction by by the journal. Um, yeah, I think another thing is also within the plant pathology com community. I think probably from the first like cloning of the first resistance genes, this idea of well, what if we can engineer them against anything? That's really been a big idea, and and there have been several examples uh where where they've done some of this engineering uh, one one case is uh, by Roger Inner's lab where they've engineered the RPS5 PPS1 system uh but that's you know against different proteases so what if you can make it even broader and this this idea that with nanobodies we could target virtually anything i think that idea that is a, a really powerful uh I, concept and like people really like that within within this particular community so i think this was Probably a big dream. Uh, yeah, I mean, still has to go into the field. There's, there's many steps to to be done yet. Uh, but but this this idea was a uh, that's sort of the 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 dream. <laughs> Can I add something quickly? Um, I was just wondering because Mark pre-lighted your preprint in 2021, and then he looked into your paper in 2023, and he specifically said that figure four in the preprint is the one that he missed the most, which was a beautiful summary figure. Uh, so could you maybe comment on, on that? Just, just wondering what happened. Well, transgenics happened. So it was the choice of, yeah, do we keep this nice like placeholder for the, for the, well, the, the conclusion and the abstract and how we could take it for, further? Or do we showcase the fact that it also works in stable transgenics? It was not an easy decision, and we were quite torn about it, to be honest. Uh, but in the end, since it was one of the major comments and concern from, from the review where we thought that maybe we should put it in the main uh, in the main text text and keep the, the illustration for the supplementary figure. And that, that camel was made by, uh, by Pi? Yes, from the lab. She's in her lab, who also does scientific drawings, so she she has several things on Twitter with with some cool covers of other journals as well. Now, how easy was for for you to decide, or what was taken into account when you decide? Okay, this goes into the main figure, and this goes into the supplementary. What do you take into consideration? Is that how you tell the story, the main finding, the main take home message? More of the, I want to know more of the thinking process of it. I think most of it was rather clear. I personally, you know, I, I would have considered putting the nanobody engineering further. That's now a supplemental figure. Uh, I really personally really like that result. Um, and I, I think it also, that result actually shows a little bit about, you know, the potential biology as well, where when we look at allelic variation in nature, uh, we think that all of this allelic variation is really involved in binding different effectors. But now we show, oh, perhaps, you know, when we do it with this, some variation could actually be involved in getting rid of autoactivity. And, and that really makes you think that, you know, the symbio approach can make you interpret biological data in a, in a different way. So I really like that. But I mean, that 
in the end, you know, like for the for the story and to make it more concise and all of that, that yeah, it made sense to go into a supplement, uh, even though I very much uh, liked that one result. I don't know if you have any particular results that you feel like should have been made. Um, no, I think this was a very good example. And well, with the final illustration as well, uh, of course. Yeah. But I think the, 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 the narrative was pretty easy in that case. So we have the engineering and further engineering, then it works uh, against the virus in transient assays and then in stable uh, in stable lines as well. So even though the narrative was quite easy, even if we are torn, like which figure we can use. So we put the main figure in illustrating all of these steps in the main text and additional controls, all the things that we've tested uh, just to make it a bit more robust went into the, the supplementary figures. Like when we tested different infectious clone of PVX, for example, to see if it was not just an artifact of this one particular clone, but if we use another one, it also works. Okay, thank you so much. The presentation was amazing, and I think the discussion was really good. Um, I think it's time to close at 101. So thank you so much for coming here and showing your research, and I hope you the best for um, the future.